Hi, so in this video, I want to talk about um, text to image AI generation or AI text to image generation using uh, stable diffusion. And this isn't a video about um, installing it because there's plenty of those. If you just go to the um, YouTube and uh, type in stable, let's do automatic because that's the one we're doing um, installation um, this is about automatic 1111's uh, web UI for stable diffusion which is uh, an open source tool for being able to generate uh, images using text similar to mid-journey similar to um, other AI generation tools, but it's pretty complex. So what this video is going to be about is actually not installing the tool because there's a couple of ways to do it. I will show you an alternative way to get to it. Uh, but what I'm really going to explain is like, what do all these knobs and bells and whistles do and how to get to the point of training your own models to uh, generate images or, or to modify the stable diffusion model. So in order, uh, just as a quick intro of how to get to this thing, to get to the point where I've got this thing installed on my machine, you'll need uh, an NVIDIA GPU to run this. Uh, you'll want to find a good stable diffusion install guide. Uh, here's one right here on YouTube. This is a real you can B &H customer this. store. Uh, usually they'll get you there. What you'll need to do when you take any of these routes, if you're going to install it on your machine at some point, is actually go to the GitHub for this tool, which is the Stable Diffusion Web UI. And if you're not familiar with GitHub, the tutorials will explain it. You'll end up downloading this code, running a bunch of stuff, getting it installed on your machine. And at some point, you're going to get to the point where you're in a command prompt and you're going to be in the directory that you've installed this code on on your machine. Um, and you're going to run this web UI bat. The reason I'm running it now, which I'm not actually in the directory that I need, right there it is. And then I want to run this. And it's going to run this code uh, because mine timed out. The, the server that it creates will time out if you don't interact with it at a certain, uh, for a certain amount of time. And that's why I've got this little error down here it's not connected but once this code runs um, so it's running it's installing everything um, once it runs you will be able to load this 127.0.01 port 7860 and in this case I'm running the dark theme question mark underscore underscore theme equals dark and you'll get this interface, which will allow you to enter text and do all kinds of image manipulation with the tool. Alternatively, you can run this same process through what's called a Google Colab, which is if you just go and you can search, we'll go do a search for automatic 1111 Google Colab, come up to the Colab Research Google, GitHub, Blob Main, and it's gonna be this. And if you click on that, It'll take you in what's called a, a Google Collaboration or Google Collab Notebook. And to run that, again, you'll be able to find these things on a YouTube video. You just check and run each one of these steps, step by step. And then at some point, you're going to end up running it, and you'll have the exact same thing running to a server that I have here. And you'll be able to run this. This method allows you to run it. It's not running on your local machine, but it will allow you to run it uh, using uh, cloud-based GPUs. And uh, the trick will be that you're going to run this on your Google Drive because um, some of this, a lot of these models are going to get installed to folders on your Google Drive. Uh, so you have to have some space on your Google Drive, and it's going to generate images to those folders on your Google Drive. So that's the difference. Like. The one that I'm running is local to my machine. I have a, uh, an NVIDIA 3090, and I'm able to run this uh, on my machine fairly fast uh, without having to hit the web or whatever. 
Uh, in this case, if you run it on this, you're actually running it on the cloud. It's an instance that you kind of temporarily own on the cloud, and it will store everything on your, your Google Drive. So to explain um, what we're going to get into here, it takes a little background in terms of what uh, Stable Diffusion actually is. So Stable, in my opinion, I'm not sure if this is true, implies the fact that when you run this, this, this generation, uh, it's going to run based on a seed. And if you know that seed number, you can re basically generate the same image based on a text prompt every time versus mid journey and Dolly, which if you type in a text prompt, it's going to give you a random image, um, when you generate it and you can get the seed for those. But in this case, you can, you can keep the seed input it and run a bunch of modifications to get the image just the way you want it. So I kind of like it for that because it's a little bit more stable, pardon the pun. The diffusion part um, stands for this idea of, let's just do this, let's see what it comes up with. Diffusion noise, because what it's done, the model is trained, here's a good example, Uh, this is an article that explains what's going on, but the gist is this, that it's taking some image that it's trained, uh, a, a bunch of images on the internet um, that it's trained on, and it's using that as a source for the, the noise generation that it's creating. It generates this noise, and then it runs a diffusion or a denoiser based on these sampling methods, these algorithms right here, that will um, slowly resolve the image based on the model, the way the model is trained using uh, image pairs with like a, a dog slash uh, schnauzer, whatever. And like it's got a bunch of images. I don't want to go too much into that. You can look it up. But the gist is the noise. That's the diffusion part. These, these noise um, denoising algorithms that it's using here, Euler A, Euler, LMS, Yuen, D, D, DPM2, all of these are just different ways to denoise the starting point, the, the noise that it's coming from here. And as it does that, it slowly, let's imagine this process in reverse, like imagine you've asked it for a dog, like a Boston or maybe a French bulldog. Um, it starts with this noise. It actually starts with an image, runs it, noises it, then runs it and denoises it. Uh, and it gets, it resolves until it finally comes to what it understands, the thing that you've asked for, in, the, in this case, a French Bulldog or a Boston Terrier, it resolves that image for you. Now, so that's, that's the rough overview of it. Um, like I said, you can go and look, there's all kinds of explanations for how to do it, but just keep that in mind because that's this stuff, sampling method here. It helps you understand why and how that works. It helps you understand what these sampling steps is about because each one of these steps is an attempt by the denoiser to resolve the image. So if you only ran it for like one step here, uh, you're going to get something that's not super resolved. So let's see if it runs. I may have had to like reboot the browser. Okay, it's running. Um, and this is it. So it's, it's taken the noise that it started with based on a seed and you can click on the image and see down here, the seed is this three, three, eight, one, one, five, five, two, five, two, six. Uh, and it's, it's denoised it to a point. Now, one step isn't going to give you anything. The next step, if you ran it for two and let's copy this seed and put it in here would take it one step further. So it's going to run it using the same seed. So I'm going to get rough with the same image. Uh, and it's going to, and these are like following seeds, like the next seed after each one of these. So it's taken like this seed and then the next one and then the next one and the next one. Um, so it's like slowly resolving. So if you run this for like, let's do it for 10 steps using the same seed. And I've told it to do a Renaissance sculpture of me because I've trained this model to recognize my face. 
sculpted by Michelangelo, marble statue. You see that it's it's taking that image noise and slowly resolving it as it goes through each step. Uh, if you ran it for 20 steps, I'm running the Euler A here, uh, diffuser, or the diffusion model. It will, and each these steps, each step you take, run, uh, takes a little bit longer to run. So you can see by the time you get to 20 steps, it's diffused something out. Not all of them are great, but it's it's doing its best to resolve what I've asked for from the image it's been given. So like that's the tricky, that's the stable part. It takes the same noise for each seed. This uh, this part right here, uh, and and what and the reason it just generated something before I even put in a seed here. When you put in negative one, it's just going to pick a random seed and generate in this case four images that I've asked for from that. So now it's not going to give me the same noise if I run it again. And um, it'll just generate the best it can come up with for each one uh, based on the samples that I've allowed it to, to run. Um, the aspect ratio that I've asked for, you can see where it's like it's still got some of the noise in there. That's because it hasn't finished in this case, it hasn't gotten far enough to resolve because each, the longer you let it run, the lo the better it's going to do. Sometimes, sometimes you can let it run too far. So if I go to, let's just go to 30 because it starts to resolve really quick once it gets to an image. So the difference between 10 and 20 is, or is let's call it Z, one and 10 is going to be not that much. It's going to look bad depending on the, the sampling method. Cause some of these actually resolve quicker than the others. Uh, and the reason that we have so many options is each one of them denoises in a different way. So you get a slightly different image because you can imagine if you start with that really early step, uh, one tiny little difference in the denoising at that point is going to shift this entire image in a totally different direction. So that's the trick here is like, how long you let this thing run in terms of sample steps and you don't, and you can go overboard because at some point it can resolve too far and it's not going to do much between, uh, let's just run it for 50. Now, again, these take longer, so there'll be a little bit more of a pause here, but the difference between 50 and 70, it might change, but the difference between 70 and hundred, it might not change that much and the image will look relatively the same and it may, may actually get worse. So, uh, sometimes, you may want to, you want to start low and work up, right? All of these are getting saved, by the way, in a folder. Like every time you generate these, it's going to generate those images. If you're doing it through the Google Colab method, it's going to generate them on your, your Google Drive. If you're doing it my way, you're going to be generating them wherever you've installed this on your machine. And you'll end up with a folder. Let's see. It's full of images, and so you, yeah, you want to have a lot of hard drive space, basically. So, um, still resolving. Okay, so you see, like, what did I run here? Fifty. It does a pretty good job. Like each one of these is going to resolve pretty well. To yes, this is me. Uh, me as a statue, uh, or uh, Renaissance statue in this case. Um, it's going to resolve pretty well. Now, if we ran that, I don't want to run it for hundred cause it's going to take a little, it's going to, it'll run pretty good, but you can see too that the, the colors are still there. So like it could actually still resolve some more to get rid of that. Um, so let's keep that. I like these, all of these, I'm going to keep that C just copy it here. This is the stable part again. So now I'm working from the same image, this one, uh, and I can play around with my prompt and get it slightly modified. So, um, and I'm just going to work back now. Wait, that was the last one. So yeah, let's work from this one. This is the seed that I copied. Um, and it's, if I generate that, if I just go back just to show you the difference for that one, if I go back to 30 and generate it, it'll probably be roughly the same, but it'll look a little less finished. It may look better. Um, Kind of just depends again on the denoising that you use. This DPM 2A 
I've noticed tends to add a little bit of color in or doesn't resolve as quick so it takes longer so you'll end up with more color noise in this than you might if you use like Euler A but you're also going to get a slightly different image because of the difference in the algorithm. Um, so let's let this run. Yeah, you can see where it's it's very different. And here's th this is the reason for the noise. All of this color, blue, purple, that's th saying it's it's not quite there yet. It's still running. Um, so if I go back to Euler A, which is a fairly fast resolver, it'll go a lot faster. Probably look better. Probably look a little bit different at this 30. But we'll see here. But you can tell it's it's resolving faster, and the result's going to be uh, probably look a little bit better. Yeah. So there's like you can tell like it's the same number of samples, but this particular method, and again, it resolved differently. It's slightly different image than the other method. So that's the reason for all of these sampling methods is that each one of them will generate a slightly different image. Some of them will, 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 for the same number of samples, will look almost the same. The noise that's in those samples will be slightly different. Um, I find these DPM2, like Euler A is pretty great. Uh, this DPM2 uh, Keras and any of the DPM2s are pretty good too. Um, and then the DDM as well are the ones I tend to play around with a lot. Um, and it's just depends on the image, depends on the seed. You're going to want to, it's a lot of this is just hitting a button and running it to see how it ends up. So I'm just going to show you the difference between the Euler A and this DPM2 Keras, which is going to, like you can tell, it's running a little bit slower for the same number of samples. It probably won't resolve as much for the same number of samples, so there may be more color noise in this as well. Um, I'm not sure. It seems like these lay out in the interface. Well, actually, it resolved pretty good. Um, the I was going to say, it seems like these resolve fastest to slowest. I could be wrong. You can look up the speeds for them. Uh, some of them, like there's DPM fast, DPM adaptive. You run this DPM adaptive is pretty slow, but again, it'll generate some... some um, some of these will just generate a better image for the number of samples uh, compared to, I'm still generating four at a time. No wonder it's taking so long. Um, I'll come back, I'll, I'll flip it down to one. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's the ex kind of the explanation of the sampling steps, the number of samples. Uh, width, height, pretty self-explanatory. The way the model's trained, it's trained on 512 by 512 images, the original uh, stable diffusion model checkpoint. You'll know what that is when you go to install this or run through the Google Colab. Basically, it's the, the machine learning uh, model data of what's been trained. And you need to have that running through this, this Python library of, of code in order to connect the model for the stable diffusion to an, another machine learning model, which is a, a, a text recognition or text understanding model um, that will connect the two so that when you type in text, it says, oh, I know what you're asking for, and here's the thing that I'm getting from the model. Let me resolve that out, depending on all of your bells and whistles down here in terms of what you've added. Um, so you could see that that uh, DPM adaptive took a long time to run. Um, let's see how it looks. Yeah, it generates, a, you know, just different. And that's, that's the reason is each one of these, like I said, when you look at them on this low sample rate, the result, I'm going to just generate one all of the beginning samples are probably going to look roughly the same for this seed. I'll show you. We're going to step through this. Uh, may have run. <laughs> it is trying to iterate. I don't think it's getting far enough on the sample there. So we're going to, there it goes. Uh, I was still running the other one. Um, 
because there's no way that's one sample. So I've set the batch count down to one. Uh, we'll get into what this config scale means because that's another tweaker, uh, but we'll get there. I'm going to work down the list here, and then we're going to work across these tabs. So um, I'm on DPM Adaptive. I've set the sampling steps down to one. If we generate that, we're going to see some noise. We should see some noise. Um, it returns. It's taking its time. This is my uh, console for running locally on my machine. It's interesting. So let's go back to Euler A. We're going to generate it from there. This will return noise. So if you look at the Euler A noise here and then just run Euler, it's going to be pretty much, it looks slightly different, but I don't know if you can see the difference, but it popped a little bit. But it does start with roughly the same noise across the board for each one of these. You see how fast they generate. Yeah, that one popped a little bit. Uh, this DDIM is a good one. There's a difference in the noise, so you can see there's a big difference there. That's why it sh that's why it um, shows up so much or creates basically a different image because there's a huge difference between that simple Euler noise and the DDIM that I just showed there. Let's see what PLNS looks like. Same as the DDIM roughly. So this, like you can see, they're just different algorithms for noise, but they're kind of taking the same uh, concept as starting with noise, slowly resolving it, uh, denoising it until you get an image. And that's the way it works. So, that's why you play around with these. You find kind of your favorites because you're gonna you're, once you've generated enough images, you're gonna find some of them just inherently do better. But what you do is when you come to a, a something you're trying to do, like doing an image to image uh, matchup uh, of of doing a, a paint in or a fill, or in paint. Um, sometimes you have to swap the algorithm just to get it to generate better. Uh, and this is it's just. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, this is just based on my experience, why it, how it works. And I'm going to take you through those steps in a sec. So, um, so now you understand, hopefully, cranking up these samples. You don't need much. Usually 20s, that's why it defaults to 20. Um, and it takes the least amount of time to generate something to start with. And that's what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to take your... Uh, Run the lowest number of samples. Try a couple of different of your favorite uh, algorithms here. Play around with image size because that's going to change. So like, look, if I change this, because imagine it too, like imagine that noise. If I start with a different aspect ratio, it's going to change the way the noise resolves because some of the noise that's kind of seeding out or causing it to resolve isn't going to be there and it's not going to be able to resolve differently. So it's going to, by, by changing this aspect ratio, it should come up with a different image and it did. Um, so that tells you right now, playing around with this, that the aspects, uh, changes a lot of what you end up with, right? So, um, depending on the, if you go with the, um, Google collab method, um, or if you're running it locally and what your machine is capable of running, you can go a little bit bigger on the scale. Uh, they're slowly getting this uh, automatic tweaked to run fast and light in terms of how much memory, GPU memory it takes. So you can crank it up and uh, it'll probably generate just a bigger version of the same. Well, I don't know, the noise may be different. Let's see, um, same image here, if it comes up with a bigger or more resolved. Yep, yep, totally different. So. That tells you, like, the noise, when we go back to, let's just go back and take it back a step again just to explain, because this will help you understand how this, how's this stuff work. There's the noise, same seed. I just went with a bigger, um, 
bigger size and now this noise that it starts with looks totally different than if I went with 512 there see that's the reason that these tweaks like changing the width and height changing the algorithm changing the sample steps resolves to a different image that's what's going on uh, it's still using the same starting point which is the seed this is a stored part of the model that is based on an image that the model was trained on and it's taking that image no turning it into noise which resolves to something like this we've already run one step on it so it actually would be the zero level on it if this is where the noise would be um, and that's it's it's that's how it's generated because it could randomly generate noise uh, too but uh, this gives you a little bit more control um, over how to uh, kind of a starting point for being able to generate images. So play around with um, aspect ratios, image size, sampling methods, and in general, you're going to want to start at 20 steps. Uh, there are times when you're when 20 steps isn't enough. You're going to need to crank it up, especially when you're doing the stream booth stuff. Uh, later, um, you're going to want to crank it up for that because it's just going to take longer to resolve and get the details that you want from whatever you're, you've trained it on. Uh, not always. It, it just depends on, again, the text prompt and a bunch of other things. Um, we won't get too into prompts. We'll get into more when I start to do the Dream Booth stuff for that. I may split the Dream Booth stuff off into a different video to explain it so that I just want to kind of get you familiar with this um, text to image and image to image prompting uh, for stable diffusion and understanding how that works. And then um, introduce this idea of training the model and adding to it because that's what you're doing. Okay, so um, one of the things to understand about this is that helps with these image generations now that we're at, let's, let's do 30. I'm going to leave it on Euler A because it's a fast image generation. I'm going to leave it squared too. Uh, so let's just do uh, a French Bulldog. Just as a simple prompt. There it is. Notice it comes up with this image. I've said I left this negative prompt in there. No pro no contrast, no iris. I'm going to take that out. The reason I had that no contrast, no iris is that that helped me when I was trying to generate a statue. Now I want to generate uh, something that actually has some eyes and has, and each one of these is going to be different because I haven't specified, I said a French bulldog. I haven't specified, is it a photo? Is it an illustration? So if we say, uh, illustration of a, you don't really need the A. Um, you have a certain amount of text you can put into these prompts. Um, and depending on how much you put into it, it, uh, it focuses on the stuff at the beginning more so than it, than it, the stuff at the end. That's, it's a kind of priority chain. So let's do a complex prompt. We're going to do photo graph of a French bulldog. And in this case, instead of doing uh, French separate, I'm going to do an underscore. So it's going to understand, I want to consider these two things together. I'm not saying a French bulldog, which could be any break. It'll come up with French bulldog normally, but sometimes things can get confused. So if you add this underscore, it's sort of marrying these two concepts together and it'll do better at trying to understand what you're asking for. So by saying photograph a French bulldog, let's just see what we get. Okay. So now we have a photograph. It's, Got a lot of noise because I'm running Euler A. I'm not r running many steps. Let's crank it up to 50. Oh, I'm also running on a, uh, a trained model here. Um, this is a, mo uh, a checkpoint of me running the training for my images against the 1.5 model checkpoint. So I'm going to change this to the 
screen, the, the, the one that you'll, def you'll download when you run this installation or you run the Google Colab, I'm changing it to the original model, sans my training. Uh, let's see if it does any differently. It should do roughly the same. But this will tell me, because this is kind of an interesting concept. I want to see if, if my training has altered its understanding of the original model. Uh, hopefully it comes back exactly the same. So <laughs> that tells you that by running this Dream Booth Google Colab, um, the Dream Booth part of this, where you want to train your own images, you're actually getting a slightly different model out of it. It, it alters the model a little bit. Um, that's why I have all of these models, because like I will also just the way same way I'm playing with all of these bells and whistles here, sliding this stuff back and forth. I'll try different models to see if one works better, especially on the ones that I've trained, if one works better than the others. So in this case, uh, for the Stable Diffusion default models, there is a Stable Diffusion 1.5 pruned checkpoint that may change by the time you see this video. It may be on some later version. There's also this in painting version, which is specifically a it does better. It's trained in a different way. The images have been called. I don't know exactly what's different about it. I do know that it's got a slightly different neural network structure, so you can't actually use it with Dream Booth. It fails right now. But if you run that, um, it's supposed to perform better on the image, the end painting that goes in this next tab, image to image. We'll get into that. Um, but right now, I'm just going to run the standard model here. There's, let's just see what the difference between uh, using the same uh, seed, what the difference between this guy and our 1.4 model, which is this model checkpoint right here, would be. So what happened is when I first installed this, I had the Stable Diffusion 1.4 model. Um, and in the time that I've been playing with it, they've come out with a 1.5, which is you know, been trained longer on the data set and been supposedly trained on a more aesthetically pleasing images. Uh, but, you know, it's for you to decide if that's true. So you can see, yeah, there's a difference. Each one of these model checkpoints is going to return a slightly different result. That's all right. I mean, you know, in the end, it's how you end up tweaking the prompt. You can probably come back to roughly the same thing. Um, so this is the old, the, the original checkpoint, uh, which seems to do better in this case on uh, French Bulldogs. And then this would be, I'm going to run the 1.5 because that's the one I'm training for my, uh, my Dream Booth stuff. So um, we're probably going to cover this tab by tab <laughs> at the rate I'm going right now because there's still a lot to cover in this text to image tab. Um, so we've got a photograph of a French bulldog. Great. It seems to be doing what I expect. We'll get back to the one that it generated, uh, which was pretty nice for the one five, this one. Um, let's crank it up to a hundred just to see if it's, like I said, the higher you get on these, the more resolved. So hundred may be too much. It may be, it, can, it may, not change much. This will kind of tell us uh, if it's kind of finished the resolution on this this particular image. Yep, it's relatively the same. So probably, I'm betting I could go back to about seventy and get roughly the same. Let's see. Yeah, slightly. Okay, we want to run it fast, so I'm going to go back to 50. Let's actually take it back to 30 and just see. The speed matters. Yep, okay, we'll do 30. Um, now, once I've got that going, let's try running uh, negative prompt. So let's just do like color. It should take the color out of the image. Actually, it didn't, but it resolved. Notice it resolved the image better just by adding that one word in a negative prompt. 
Why? Again, I don't know. Uh, it does show though that by doing negative prompting, A, you're changing the image, but you're also making the image better. It's gonna resolve better with a negative prompt almost always. So having some sort of negative prompt will help. So like you might say, color, comma, blur, or blurry. It's gonna say no blur. Now we end up getting a totally different image and it's just this uh, paper cut version of it. Maybe blurry wasn't the thing I wanted. All right, there we go. Let's try no green. Changes. Yep, change the background, slightly change the image. So that tells you, you can play around with this thing and that's one way of tweaking it to get what you want. Um, you could also say black and white. Now, in this case, we've got black and and white as individual words, those don't mean much. Like the, the, the text understanding model here does not understand this as a sentence. It looks at it as a word, another word, another word. Uh, this one most important, this one's second most, third, like it's breaking it down into tokens. Uh, so in order to get it to treat this black and white as a single word, just insert those underscores. You could also say grayscale if you wanted, but black and white photograph. In fact, let's just make it underscore. Let's see what that does. There we go. Well, not great. Let's take it that back out and this might get us back to Yeah, black and white photograph. Um well, kind of black and white. You can see you're asking for it. Um it's doing its best to understand there. It's thinking you're asking for black and white colors and a photograph of a French bulldog. Um, it doesn't understand you're wanting something that's maybe more uh, vintage. <laughs> so we might try vintage uh, old and yeah, let's leave that. We can put commas in the prompts. I've got this append commas automatically. So now you get a black and white photo of a French bulldog. Um, you could do Victorian. Let's try that. See what happens. Slightly different, more black and white. Still has a little color in there. Um, retro. So what I'm trying to point out here is the more input you give this thing, the more it's going to give you back and the better it will understand your prompt and probably the more resolved the prompt will be. So let's do vintage photograph of Bulldog, Victorian era, 1890s. Uh, might even try tin type. That may go too far. I won't do that yet. Um, you can state something twice. Black and uh, uh, let's do yeah. Let's try tin type and just see. Tin type was a type uh, photo photographic technique back then, maybe before then, but that's probably going to make it look really, yeah, that's pretty good actually. Um, so you see, it's resolved way more. It's added more detail. It's actually put them on this nice leather couch. You can keep going. Like let's say uh, wearing bowler. So you may not think it, but just by putting this A in here, I've changed the result that it will give me, even though it's not going to understand A much. 
it just changes the weights of these other things. Uh, it's not wearing a bowler hat, so we'd have to put that further up in the line in order to kind of enforce it on the character here. So let's do vintage photograph of Finch Bulldog wearing a tiny bowler hat. Let's marry those two together so it understands I'm asking for a bowler hat. I believe the tiny. Take the A out just to kind of help with the weighting. And that got me back to color. It's actually the image. I don't understand. It may be that the um, tiny wearing A. There we go. Uh, so you see little things can, it's not a bowler hat, but it doesn't seem to quite understand what a bowler hat is, but, uh, you get the idea. Um, if I take this tin type out, it's probably going to change it. I'll show you. Yep. Even better. Um, uh, so you can tell each one of these texts uh, words or uh, tokens is what it's what they're called is basically altering the way it's processing the image based on an algorithm right uh, so now if I go let's try it's a pretty good picture let's try cranking the road I want so I want something that might do more vertical uh, and then by doing that maybe I zoom out a little bit on see yeah it got me a little more vertical um let's try sitting on a pillow kind of got him by putting the pillow in there, the idea was that I was pushing it further back in the scene because it had to fit the pillow in there. So you, you can get where you can mechanically alter the prompt in order to uh, change the view or kind of crop the, the, the image, make the dog smaller. So let's do, um, eh, that's enough of that. Let's keep that for now. And let's take this green back and see, because we we're getting a black and white image now, so we don't need to leave that in there. And it, that is altering the image. So, yep. So we get back to something different. Uh, now that we've covered, hopefully you get the gist of how to create this prompt, how it plays with things, how the negative prompt works, what the sampling steps do, what the sampling method does how the width and the height plays with it. Um, there's these options down here, which are intended to, in our case, fix human faces, this restore faces. That's introducing another image or uh, machine learning based model that's specifically intended to um, fix the eyes uh, when you run something like a, a human face or whatever. So let's do I'm going to do a vintage photograph of a person. Leave the sitting on a pillow out. Probably don't need that. <clears throat> Here we go. Yeah, that, yeah, that'll work. Um, and... In this case, it didn't really mess with his face. So let's do a person's vintage uh, what's the word here? There's this function down here called style pile, which will let me set the image type like that. Uh, the view 
and it'll give me an idea of something I can do. So let's do a medium shot angle here. Vintage medium shot angle photograph of a person wearing that should zoom it in a little bit more. It's going to at least alter the image. Nope, not much. Uh, it may be, well, it's the noise. There's a way to drive it, but it's probably in this, uh, the seed. I'm going to go back to generating a random seed because it'll generate something that's mid range. Cause I'm trying to get a zoom in on the face in order to see, uh, see how the face, um, part of the fit, the restore faces works. So we got four running. Hopefully one of these is mid medium shot. There we go. Let's go with, uh, probably this guy. Um, so we'll take his seed. Trying to get the data. All right, so for some reason, the, oh, I know why. But by opening style pile here, even though I didn't click on anything, it's running this, this is a script. It's an extension that I've added. The, I'll get into the intent of that, but it basically just lets you force styles on things. So um, I could go and do any of these pull downs like photography, uh, let's do amusing, um, grayscale, and uh, let's see what tilt shift does. Focus on masculine portrait. We're going to leave that. We're going to leave the visual parts out and just see what it generates. It's going to make the image very different. Um, but it's going to add the style pile part. And when we do that, we actually lose, uh, some of the interface here that it's generating, um, where it gives me the seed and the data for it, but that's okay. We can get that back because every time you run one of these, when it's puts it in a folder, so you can see how it changed it. Um, not for the better, but it did mess with the faces a little bit. Um, so that's what style pile does. You can play with that. It's can be hit or miss. <laughs> I'm going to turn that off. We're going to go back to generate and I'll get one of the seeds and then we'll play from there. Um, Yeah, this one's got a messed up face. That's good. This guy right here. So his seed is this. Copy that. And we'll change our batch count back to one. So we're just going to run his image. Let's run it. <coughs> Here's his image. And the idea here is I want to, you can see where his eyes are sort of cut out and not right. So what should happen is when we turn on restore faces is it should go and attempt to fix the eyes and anything that's wrong with the image. After the fact, there we go. So it's gone and inserted some eyes. It actually put some color in there too. That's what I've noticed. Um, with this, uh, the model that I'm using for this is that it tends to try to put some color in the image. Like it's trained probably on color images and wants to work on color photography. So black and white or sculptures, uh, it may not have the result you want. Um, what you can do is you have multiple versions of this. If you've installed, depending on how you've installed, uh, automatic 1111, 
that you can go under settings and <laughs> don't 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 leave. It's it's we don't have to change all this stuff. I just want to point out where you can go in and make some more tweaks if you want to. Um, it's for upscaling a bunch of the other features that we probably won't get into in this video, but you'll we'll get there eventually. Um, but the main thing is this face restoration part right here. I'm using Code Former, which is a better version of a face fixer. You can also use this GFP GAN. I'm betting that probably won't introduce the um, color as much. So we're going to swap that back. Then we'll go back to our text to image. Uh, leave the restore faces there. So now instead of using code former, it's going to use the GFP GAN and we'll run it and we'll see and it should come back with a different way of fixing the face. Hopefully without, no, it did pretty much the same. That's not good. Well, stick with the code former then. Uh, if you're working on color photography or something else, you're basically just going to get the eyes fixed. That's pretty much all it's doing. Um, Turn that back off. Another way to maybe get at it to try to fix the face. Um, and it's just this one eye. You could obviously fix that in Photoshop, but um, is to go with this high res fix, which is another option that if you say, um, click that, what it's going to do is run a low first pass. And then at a specific denoising strength, we'll get into what that means. Um, and then resolve that at a higher resolution for the final size to try to, f to do a better job of it. So it's almost like making two passes on the same thing. So let's run that. <sighs> yes, yeah, it came back with a different image. That why? Why did it come back with a different image? Because we're running this twice. We're running the first one at 256 by 448, where before we were running 512 by 704. So the noise is going to be different, as I showed earlier. So if we crank this up to 512 by 704, right there. And then we can crank this one up just a little bit bigger. Um, it should give us the guy that we were working with in the first place because this is going to be the same noise set up. And then it's going to resolve that to try to fix any issues that it has in a better way. So let's see what we get there. Yep. There you go. Perfect fixed his eyes. Um, so hopefully that illustrates uh, everything that I've shown you so far, which is why the noise is different, why what makes the noise different, how it resolves, how that affects the final image. And then in this case, with this high res fix, the way to go at coming up with a better image, really, overall, but doing it in a way that allows you to kind of like find the one you want to use at a low rate. Um, turn this high res fix on, set it to the pro the set, the original settings. It's the reason that we have all of these settings set up and we kind of hang on to them so we can start back. We can get the stable part where we can work on an image again and again and again and generate it again and again and again. Um, and then up res that kind of like what mid journey does when you're doing an upscale to bring back the details and work on fixing it. So what happened in this case was we generated that first guy, his eye was messed up. We up it. It recognized that that's supposed to be an eye and it went in and made it better. Okay. Um, but the only reason that it did that was because we changed the second pass, this one, to be a higher number than the original pass. If we go back and we make this 512, it may actually even try to fix it the second time if we leave it the same. So if we make it 512, 704, 
it may actually also try again because it's going to be generating from the original and try to do kind of a text-based recognition of the image, yep, to, to generate um, a second version just at a slightly different resolution. So by upping the resolution there, it's like we're it's like we're giving it two noise samples when we do this, um, when we do this high res fix. The first time we run this, we get this image. It's doing it based on a really low quality noise and slowly resolving up from there, right? If we run this high res fix, it's going to take and almost start with like this image and run uh, one more pass on it using that image as the starting point to get a better result. And that's why the eye will get fixed. It may actually put in some more wrinkles or let's look. Yeah, it added some more noise to the image, fixed the eye. Um, and then if we, you know, if we go and we crank that image up like here, to like something like that, um, it's just going to, it's going bigger. Again, this is very GPU intensive. The bigger you go on these images, the longer it'll take. And you may actually run out of memory, especially if you're on this, uh, the, co the Google Colab, because um, they don't give you a lot, a lot there. You can see where it went back and messed his eye up. But the image result's a lot nicer. Uh, let's try doing the restore faces on that version. Let's see what happens. Uh, let's see what else we've covered seed oh the config scale that's the biggie um and i'll show you how that works yeah see it added the color back in and didn't really fix the eye grade anyway so turn that back off all right uh config scale what is that basically um let's get back out of high res fix here so we're not running this thing twice and we're going to crank this back Cyrus fix 512704. There we go. Turn that off. All right. Um, config scale is how much you expect it, how creative do you want the model to be with the, res the resolving of this text to the image from the noise? I've got it cranked up really high here with this config cell 25.5. Normally it'd be down here around 7.5 or something like that. So you'll see where if I crank that down, it's going to give me something very different. Um, if I go down to like 3, it's going to give me something that's very, very different. And what it's really doing here. The lower you go down on this CFG scale, if I go down to one, it's basically going to give me the original image that it started with when it generated the noise sample based on the seed in the first place. Which means if I go low on the config scale, I may actually get a copyrighted image uh, for what I'm generating. Or it's going to be closer to what the original was anyway. Um, and we'll see that right here. So I went down to one. This is this could be the original image. It probably doesn't exist because it's piecing things together, but it's it may be based on something. If I cop well, yeah, if I copy this image, I would need a a link to, to do an image-based search. But if we go to M Google image search. Um, image based search. search. I recommend doing this to um, yeah, um, doing it based on image so that you can actually check and make sure the image you're generating isn't uh, actually an image that's on the internet already. Cause you can get that from this. Um, and you, can, you might be able to get it from other models as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save this image. 
these are some that I've run from my model. Uh, let's do test um, search. Just search there. Yep. And then in my Google Images here, I can upload. We'll see if it comes back with something similar in any of these. And this isn't the final, you know, this isn't the be all tell all in terms of like whether or not this guy is um, based off of some um, image that's out there that may or may not be copyrighted, but it's a good attempt at trying to make sure you're not putting something out there that is. Um, but anyway, that, so it looks like it's okay. I found a bunch of similar images, but it's all right. Um, so that's what the config is doing. The config is taking the end result down to something closer to what the noise from the model started as, okay? So by cranking this up to something like two when running it, it's giving it a little bit more, um, it's saying, give me a little bit more of what I asked for here using all the settings that I have and generate that instead. Um, and then by cranking it up to like seven, saying, okay, well, let's see what you, you know, be a little more creative uh, be more specific to what I've asked for and cranking it all the way up to 30. So this is another way of playing with the, the end result where this will really matter. This config scale is when you go to do training with dream booth or image to image you start where you basically start with an image and you're filling in things or you're you're modifying the image in some way. This will, if you leave it here, it's going to give you more of what you started with. And if you crank it up, it's going to give give you more of what you're asking for. That's the way the CFG scale works. Usually leaving it at something more like a 7 to 7.5 is where to be um, for a balance between where you started and, what, and getting some creativity. You'll want to crank it up more when you're doing some very specific dream booth type of uh, image to image or in paint examples. We'll get into that probably in the next video. Um, we've explained seed. Uh, so basically again, if you want to just roll the dice, set it to negative one or click on this, you can generate a seed. Um, that'll bring back where you were. I think uh, what's extra here. Oh, it'll give you an extra seed if you want to, mix and match um, between two seeds uh, and going between multiple seeds, it'll kind of mix it up. So let's do that. Let's try that one and see what happens. This is almost like taking two images, combining them with the noise and then generating from that. So it was a little different, did better on the eyes. Um, let's do random and random. So it'll give me two different seeds. This will obviously give me a different image. Uh, it's actually a pretty cool image. Um, so let's take his, put it in, let's put it in to this one. We'll leave it random on the first one and then put that seed in on the second and then do variation strength. change it so that it'll resize based on this height and the width. So you get ways of playing with generating stuff. How useful that is, uh, you can see it sort of is just giving you variations on that same theme of this guy in the hat. And it's what it seems to be doing is slowly altering it from Sorry, put this guy first. 
Let's go with that and just see what we get. Yeah, this guy to what we had originally, which was the guy standing mid length uh, as a very between the two. So um, it's going to kind of give you a, <laughs> a mix between those two so you can kind of blend. So this might zoom him out a little bit further, give you a little bit more mid. Yeah, so it slowly is altering. Did it? Well, not that much. Didn't realize it would go that far. You can see that it's going back to what we had originally. So it sort of zooms out a little bit more. Okay. Uh, more to play with. Let's see. So this latent mirror mode. And this is these, you may not have these in yours. Um, this will get me to a nice transition to the next one. There's ways to modify this tool set. By default, um, let me turn off these. Apply and restart. Those were a bunch of extensions that I had. Uh, that you won't have when you first install. So by default, when you first come in, it's going to be something like this. I uh, won't be able to get back to my uh, prompt. Actually, I can get back to my prompt. This is a good example of how, to, how do I bring back what I had. Um, when you save this, or when you've generated this, it's getting saved to either your your hard drive or your Google, your Google Drive. Um, depending on, again, which way you loaded it. So to get to that, you go to your installation. In this case, I'm going to where I installed my stable diff UI. And in that, there's going to be this outputs. Um, the outputs is going to be a bunch of different kinds, depending on what you're doing. Uh, text to image is where you can get to all the stuff that you've generated previously and then what it'll do depending on how you've uh, by default is it's going to generate an image and it's going to generate the text of what it took what you your settings were to generate that image so I could go copy my prompt here paste that copy the negative which was just color Set my set steps to 30. My sampler was older. A, my config scale was 8.5. I think I was at 7 or 512 by 704. Yep. Um, config scale was 8.5. Let's generate that. There's the guy. Um, now, what I also, but I, what I had was my um, extra seed option, <clears throat> which is here, and my variation seed was this. Variation seed strength was 2.3. And seed resize was 576 and 640. So 576, 640. And that should generate the last image that we had there. This guy. Okay. So that's the stable part. You can get back to where you were because it's saving all this stuff. And if you input the same inputs, give it the same instructions, it's going to generate the same image. That's how you can control it. Um, but what you'll see is when I turned off all these extensions, I lost my style pile and some of that other stuff. Uh, that Some of the interface went away. And I definitely lost 
a couple of tabs here. I've got, still got image to image. I don't have dream booth anymore. I don't have a couple of the other ones. Uh, if you look at my, um, when I type in my text, I don't get my, uh, prompts, my autofill prompts either, because that's an extension. So, um, there's a couple of ways to modify this interface uh, and get extra, get more out of it. You can go to the automatic GitHub, and if you look, you'll find. Well, they have scripts, so if you do, let's go back one more. Automatic eleven eleven scripts. That will come up with this custom scripts for automatic 1111 and you can get those here and there's like improved prompt matrix. Uh, if you go to the GitHub, it will show you, uh, it won't. Uh, it's basically saying you can do prompt matrices, which will generate batch images of all the different options or configurations of your prompt. So you'll get more options that way. Uh, text to image to image. Some of these will have examples of what they do. Um, just read those. But anyway, you can do scripts. Um, and you can download those scripts from the uh, sources. And then if you go into your installation, you can put those in scripts right here. OK? Um, some of them are pretty cool. Like I've downloaded, uh, we've got StylePile, which I explained. Um, it basically lets you change what you're generating to put some style on it. Or in this case, you can also do artists. So if we did Alex Ross, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what that's gonna. He's a comic book artist. Um, let's just see what that. Does. Not much, but it did change it. Um, Boris Vallejo, another uh, artist who tended to draw a lot of like muscular guys. It adds a lot more color into it. So anyway, style pile, check it out. Uh, check the scripts out. Um, what else? text to vector graphics will let you generate logos and things like that. Uh, XY plot will um, give you the ability to do like variables in your prompts and you'll get this XY plot so you can see how things kind of affect the image. It helps you kind of zone in or tweak in on uh, specific things that might be more powerful in terms of the image generation. Uh, shift attention Steps 10, show generated images in UI. Uh, this is a way of taking this prompt and then it'll shift the um, config, the CFG, shifts the attention a certain number of steps so that you get uh, an animated version in between. So you can save it to a video here. And in this case, it's going to do each it'll take the steps and it'll generate 30 frames per second as it generates the images. So I'm not going to do that because it'll take a while, but it would basically give you an animated version in this case of this guy morphing between different people. Um, I'm going to go back. That's enough on the scripts. The, uh, oh yeah, you can open another, you saw me go and search to get to my, uh, images. If you want to be able to just, um, generator guy you want to be able to just get to the image over here click on this folder it'll open your your directory where all these images are getting saved here you go all the images um, you notice when you gen we'll go now that we've covered all of this on this side if we look at the image you can save it you can send it to image to image which is basically this tab so that you can modify it further. Send to end paint, which is a tab off of image to image right here. Here's his image to image. Here's end paint. 
Uh, and then there's a batch image to image. We'll get into that probably in another video. Um, and then send to extras. Send to extras is going to allow you, because like I said, we're using a lot of memory here. Um, we may want to upscale the result here to come up with more resolution. You can use, again, machine learning to uh, upscale this thing. So if you send it to extras, it'll open up the extras tab and then it's going to have this scale resolution here. Uh, and you can pick your upscaler model. I recommend this guy, the Swin IR4X. Uh, you don't have to do the second one. Uh, visibility. You may want to, if you want to do restore faces again, you may want to do that uh, after the upscale because it'll have more to work with. And let's just run that. It's going to take a minute, but um, what you're doing here is this, like the upscale on something like Mid Journey, you're basically creating a higher resolution version of this guy. Um, in this case, he's what is resolution. Usually it'll say. Uh, let's do open image in new tab. This will show you. Yeah, he's 1024 by 1408 versus 512 by 7, uh, whatever the original size was, because I did a two times upscale on him. Um, and it does a pretty good job. Uh, machine learning just does a better job of upscaling than doing traditional forms of upscaling, like in Photoshop or whatever. So I recommend taking advantage of that if you need to generate a bigger image. Uh, and that's extras for the most part. Um, you can play around with these other, these are all, uh, algorithms for upscaling. Um, you can play around with which ones you want, see the differences. The... So this is the face fixer. GF began. Remember, I went into settings, told you not to leave. Uh, right here, I'm back on Codeformer because I relaunched because that's my default. Um, we would go to yeah. Here's our Codeformer, so we're not using GFP GAN. Here's our Codeformer visibility. This is where we would turn on the face fixing, and give it a weight. So zero is maximum effect. You can balance how much it tries to fix the face and its visibility here. And then if you run uh, generate, it'll, it should go and try to do something more with the face. So it, go, it went in and tried to fix his eyes a little bit more versus the, um, the other version. All right. So let's go back text to image. We've covered both sides of this interface. Um, how long is this video? Yep, I'm in an hour. So I'll make another video which will cover image to image stuff um, and how that works. And then from there, I'll probably start to get into the um, training and the extensions options here. Uh, most likely we might do a deform and but more likely I'll end up doing a dream booth training on an image set and showing you how to train your own model checkpoint and use that using text to image and image to image to generate whatever you want. Uh, if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments.